films are actually a particularly good place to see the way that the official wartime language of Americanism was entering into everyday American culture and into people's lives on the home front. And the man who headed the government's Office of War Information, which was the main propaganda agency, was called Elmer Davis. And he believed that cinema was, quote, the easiest way to inject propaganda ideas into people's minds. Because the idea was that cinema goers were so wrapped up in following the plot of a film that they supposedly didn't realise that they were being exposed to propaganda. So in 1942, the OWI actually set up a special office in Hollywood that was supposed to advise and influence the movie studios there and to make sure that their films were on message. And in fact, that didn't usually require very much effort or kind of active control, because for the most part, the big studio moguls in Hollywood were broadly sympathetic to the kind of image of America that the US government was trying to put across. And perhaps the key thing that commercial Hollywood films did on that front during the war was to represent and encourage the idea that the war was serving as a kind of crucible of American unity. So, for example, what we see during the war um, is the emergence of a particular genre of films, um, which began with one called Bataan in 1943, which are known as the platoon movies. And what these films did was to use the very small military unit of the platoon as a way to capture America's diversity or elements of that in microcosm. And specifically to show how any suspicion or tension that might exist between Americans of different backgrounds was now being overcome through common dedication and sacrifice for the national cause. So one of the conventional devices that was often used in the first few minutes of these films was the roll call. Um, so this would be where a sergeant or another officer would read out the platoon's names while the camera identified each soldier in the platoon one by one. And that would clearly establish that there was, in the case of Bataan, for example, uh, a Jewish soldier called Feingold, uh, an, an Irish American called Malloy, a Polish-American called Matowski, and so on, as well as a bunch of Anglo-Saxon Protestants whose specific regional and class identities would be revealed over the course of the film. So very much in contrast to the First World War, when so-called hyphenated Americans had been seen and treated as a problem, these films actually had America's ethnic diversity as one of their sort of central standout features. And of course, the message that was worked into the plot of these films was that when these diverse elements came together and worked together, then America would triumph over its enemies. And that was a significant milestone for certainly European ethnic Americans in terms of their incorporation into the dominant image of the American nation which was now this image of a kind of multi-ethnic nation of immigrants. But as we've seen, the challenge for the US government and also the culture industries that were supporting it was to mobilize the whole of the American population for war and to manage and diffuse the tensions and suspicions among all groups of Americans. And of course, when it came to African-Americans, that created quite a big headache for the Hollywood screenwriters, many of whom, in fact, were liberals or leftists and supporters of civil rights. Because they wanted to try to mobilize African-Americans into the war effort and to help to sort of generate and sustain black support for the war effort. They also were keen on this idea of promoting tolerance and respect for African-Americans among white people and, and diffusing racial tensions. But they had to somehow deal with the reality that actual American platoons were strictly segregated. They were either black or they were white. 
So some of these platoon movies basically admitted defeat and just sidestepped the whole issue by leaving out African-American characters entirely or just including them in very kind of tokenistic ways as a sort of passing black stretcher carrier from another platoon, for example. But Bataan was actually one of the films that was a bit more ambitious and its writers didn't want to give up on including African-Americans in their vision of the nation and including that message of tolerance and respect. And what they did in Platoon was to come up with a, a plot device to try to square that circle. So the film Bataan, um, which is set in the Philippines, begins in the aftermath of a local American defeat by the Japanese. And in all the chaos created by that defeat, 11 American soldiers who've become detached from their regular units now have to hastily form themselves into a new platoon. So it's under those extraordinary circumstances that we get the formation of an extraordinary unit, unlike any unit that actually existed in the US Army, which includes an African-American soldier called Epps, a Hispanic soldier called Ramirez, and also two Filipinos called Salazar and Katigbak. And here again, we're getting quite an interesting indication of where mainstream American culture was by the 1940s in terms of its representation of these various non-white groups. Because on the one hand, we see that they're being admitted effectively into the all-American platoon. So there's recognition of their contribution to the American war effort and implicitly the American nation. But at the same time, within the film, they are portrayed in noticeably different ways to the white characters. And in fact, in ways that were calculated to meet the expectations of a majority white audience by preserving some aspects of white privilege. So it's the non-white characters, and particularly um, Epps, the African-American soldier, who are seen performing the more menial tasks, such as digging graves. It's also the non-white characters who suffer the most undignified deaths at the hands of the Japanese through torture and beheading, for example. And in general, the film upholds the superiority of the white officers over their men by bringing out the intellectual capabilities of the white characters in ways that aren't replicated with the others. And if that's one indication of the persistence of racial nationalism, then another one is the way that the Japanese enemy was portrayed in Bataan and other platoon movies. Um, because in striving to mobilize American audiences for this all out war against the Japanese enemy, these films almost always demonized the Japanese as an explicitly racial others, a little bit like those First World War posters of the German quote Hun that we looked at in a previous topic. So in Bataan, the Japanese are portrayed as a uniquely cruel race and the American characters disparage them with overtly racialized phrases, uh, calling them, for example, savages and dirty monkeys. Now, we also need to think about how non-white Americans themselves experienced and responded to the war and what effects the war actually had on their status as Americans and their prospects of gaining full American citizenship rights. And in the case of African-Americans, the war presented a rather sort of complex picture of both indignity or undignified treatment, but also opportunity in certain respects. So the indignity came in the form of ongoing segregation, uh, both in the military and in civilian life, particularly the indignity of being asked yet again to fight a war for democracy, as it was called when African-Americans themselves didn't even have the basic democratic right to vote, in effect, if they lived in the US South and were still discriminated against in every part of the country in a variety of ways. But the degree of opportunity I mentioned was also evident to many African-Americans during the war, 
precisely because more than had been the case in the First World War, now the United States really needed the contribution of African Americans as soldiers and as civilians in a significant way. So that meant that there was more of an opportunity for African Americans to press for concessions and reforms in return for that contribution. And the fact that the US government was promoting these values of respect and tolerance in its propaganda and that its language of Americanism was becoming more inclusive also encouraged many African Americans to believe that they were pushing at an at least partly open door. And also this time in the Second World War, African American leaders for the most part took a very different line than many of their predecessors had taken in 1917. So at the start of the First World War, black leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois had advised African-Americans to essentially put their campaigns for equality on hold for the duration of the war in the hope that their contribution to the war effort would be rewarded with civil rights reforms afterwards. And as we know, there were no civil rights reforms whatsoever after the First World War, and the federal government in the 1920s did nothing, essentially, about segregation and white supremacy. So when 1941 came around, there were some African Americans, although relatively few, who saw no reason at all why they should support the US war effort. But the much more common response, and one that was heavily promoted by the editors of black newspapers, which were very influential in African American communities, was not to do the same as last time, but to simultaneously support the war effort and demand immediate reforms at the same time during the war. And this strategy became known as the double V or double victory campaign, meaning that African Americans would fight for victory for democracy over racism, both at home and abroad simultaneously. And that they used their contributions to the American war effort to demand full rights as American citizens while the war was in progress. And that could be seen in a whole host of different local protests, like, for example, one in Washington, D.C., where students from a famous black college, Howard University, um, organized a sit in at a segregated restaurant in 1944. And they picketed the restaurant with placards that explicitly associated their own campaign with the official US government language of civic nationalism or the American way and associated their opponent's segregationist views with Nazism. And their placards also drew attention to the sacrifices made by African-American soldiers. We die together, let's eat together. There was also a coordinated national campaign that was led by the trade union leader and civil rights activist A. Philip Randolph, and this was called the March on Washington Movement. And that essentially was a threat that Randolph made in person, actually, to FDR, that unless the federal government immediately acted on racial discrimination, then 100,000 African-American protesters would march on Washington. And that was exactly the kind of image of instability, show of disunity that Roosevelt was desperate to avoid during the war. And in some limited ways, that double, e, that double V campaign did bear some immediate fruit. Um, most notably, Roosevelt's response to the threat of a, of, of a march on Washington was to sign an executive order that created something called the Fair Employment Practices Commission to stop defense manufacturers from discriminating against black job applicants. And there were also some fairly minor concessions on military segregation, like allowing black soldiers to use the same recreational facilities as white soldiers on military bases. If we look at the longer term picture, we can actually see the Second World War as a very important precursor to the mass activism of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. So, for example, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was one of the major civil rights organizations, 
grew from 50,000 to 400,000 members during the war. And we've seen um, the use of tactics like sit-ins that would become so important in the 1950s um, and 60s. And also the tactic of using the circumstances of the Second World War to put pressure on the government to live up to America's democratic rhetoric. That was a tactic that would be very successful for the civil rights movement during the Cold War. When, as we'll see, America's claim to be a model democracy became so important for its foreign policy. But in the short term, the very limited nature of the concessions that were won by the Double V campaign meant that African-American protest couldn't really be contained by that movement. And as the war went on and white Americans continued to discriminate against and, and to harass African-Americans, violent racial confrontations became increasingly frequent within the United States. So within the military, there were hundreds of occasions when huge fights broke out after white soldiers had insulted African-American troops or tried to physically enforce the segregation regulations. And then much more visibly, in 1943, there were major civilian race riots or uprisings in Detroit and Harlem. And these riots were products of the war and its circumstances in a number of ways. So if we look at the Harlem riots in August of 1943, that actually began after an African-American soldier tried to intervene when a white policeman hit an African-American woman that he was trying to arrest. And the white policeman then shot the black soldier in the chest. And that assault, and also a rumour which in fact was incorrect that the black soldier had been killed, triggered off three days of rioting by African-American residents of Harlem, um, smashing the windows of white-owned businesses in the neighbourhood and skirmishing in the streets with the police. So to some extent, this Harlem riot or uprising was a response to police brutality, which then, as now, was a continual grievance of black communities in northern cities. But it was also symptomatic of the frustrated expectations of change that the Second World War and the Double V campaign had produced. And it reflected the particular indignity as well of black servicemen who were serving and risking their lives for the United States, continuing to be treated, as we saw in the example of the uh, incident that sparked the Harlem uprising, um, continued to be treated as inferior and, and to be targets of white supremacist violence. The riot in Detroit had actually taken place a couple of months earlier in June, um, and we could see that as a more traditional kind of race riot in America. Um, like, for example, the Chicago riot of 1919 during the, the Red Summer that we spoke about, um, in the sense that this riot in Detroit began with a white mob indiscriminately attacking African-Americans, um, which then provoked black self-defense and retaliation. And in the course of all of that, 34 people were killed and 433 people were wounded. The immediate triggers for the riot in Detroit were a bunch of, uh, in fact, wildly inaccurate rumours. Uh, one, that an African-American man had raped and murdered a white woman. That hadn't happened. Another, that a white mob had thrown a black woman and her baby into the Detroit River. That hadn't happened either. Um, but those were really just the fuses that ignited an already very volatile situation that had been gradually building up in Detroit since the beginning of the war. And at the root of all of that really was a huge wave of migration during the Second World War that brought millions of black and white southerners into northern cities like Detroit and Chicago and New York looking for jobs in the defense industries. And for African-Americans, this was the second and much bigger phase of the great migration from south to north that had begun with the First World War. And in this second phase, between 1940 and in fact it continued until 1970, 
five million African Americans left the mostly rural and small town south for the large industrial cities of the north. And partly that was because of push factors uh, like the mechanization of southern agriculture and also the system of Jim Crow itself. But it really began with the job opportunities that were opening up during the Second World War uh, for African American men in particular to get relatively paid, uh, relatively highly paid work in defense factories in cities like Detroit. And during the war, 50,000 African Americans moved to Detroit alone, which was one of the main hubs of the defense industry. Now, not only was the existing white population in Detroit uh, unhappy with this new um, arrival of black migrants who were overflowing the accepted boundaries of existing black neighborhoods and trying to move into previously all white neighborhoods, but there was also a really big influx of southern white people moving into Detroit during the war. And they were also looking for jobs in the defense factories. And they were even more determined to live in white only neighborhoods and to send their children to white only schools and to bring as much as possible of southern segregation with them. So the riot in Detroit was the culmination of hundreds of smaller confrontations between white and black people in Detroit over housing and over jobs and the kinds of indignities and harassment that again were being meted out to African Americans at the same time that they were being asked to wage a war for democracy. And in fact, President Roosevelt had to send in federal troops to help the Detroit police to bring an end to the riot after three days. And certainly there were some striking racial disparities in the official response to the riot, because although 75% of those who were injured in the riot were African Americans, 85% of those arrested were also African Americans. 